<laughs> so I'll plug you all next time we're in front of everybody for sure. So, hey, a couple of things I want to talk about. Um, he's going to call this one. Um, uh, God, and I hate to keep saying pitfalls and end alls, but uh, I just keep coming across stuff every almost every single day, which I'm very fortunate for. I'm glad that we get to talk about these things so that we're not practicing on each other and not practicing on our clients. So I'd rather us work it out amongst us and get the right answers to you um, to experience before there's a, a, a commission or a lawsuit or whatever that might be. So, um, and I'm gonna harp on this and I hope you, now that you got this out of your class you just went to, um, disclose, disclose, disclose. I just cannot say that enough. Um, if you know about it, I mean, training wheels off, you have to say something about it. You have to tell it. Um, I literally, I was on a phone call right after, before I joined this and, um, the seller never, they checked, um, NA for the whole RPD and then they negotiate in a contract all from yesterday afternoon, evening on into the night and then negotiation stopped. But then today they said, oh yeah, my deck's not permitted. They told their agent. What if they had written a five thousand dollar due diligence and they ha hammered it out last night, uh, and the deck's not permitted? Anybody want to take that one on? What happens? What can happen? So the five, seller, the seller is actually misrepresenting the property. Yep, and could be in jeopardy of having to give that five thousand dollar whatever due diligence back up, uh, as, along with any other inspection fees that's breach of contract basically yep so and agent wise like the agent thank goodness i'm so excited i don't, I don't know who the agent is it's one of ours that actually said wait a second i know this i have to tell you i just found out i did not know what we were talking all night i found out today this deck is not permitted it's like a twenty thousand dollar deck that's trucks and you know the reason being is there's an inspection at the footers and the base and the like there's four different inspections for a deck and they can literally, you know, how is it attached to the house? Is it screws? Is it nailed? Nailed is not, will not pass right now. That's gone. It has to be screwed to the house. So that deck potentially 20 some thousand dollars has to come down potentially if it doesn't approve and you can't get the permit for it again then you lose, you got due diligence tied up. You've got two to three weeks in time to get an inspector easily. That's not coming, right? Which is postponing your transaction two to three weeks, potentially. <clears throat> and then you've also got um, worst case scenario, the debt comes down and what if the seller says, I'm not putting it back? The value of the house, it's not 20K, but you, um, it's gonna, you know, dollar for dollar additions are not there but you, <clears throat> you could just put a three-step stoop on the back door. Um, but you don't, and it's on top of that, it's a VA loan. So um, the inspection is going to be a little more stringent than just a conventional. Um, we all know that. So <clears throat> um, disclose the social shows. Another one, house went under property and we got an inspection. We're the listing agent. We got an inspection done and not, not us, the buyer did and they had problems and they decided they did not want to go forward with the transaction. So they gave us a copy of the inspection. So now KW agent Jason has a copy of the inspection on my house that's listed that just terminated. I put it back on the market and what do I do? Disclose, disclose, disclose. Yep, you know it now. Whatever's on that list, you know it. And as an agent, you can't not say, I know about all these things. So the seller actually did do repairs. Did they do all the repairs? No. Did they hit the high spots and most of them, the big ones? Yes. So me, agent, private remarks and disclose say, we have an inspection on the home would be glad to share upon request repairs made what do we mess up with 
some repairs made, right. all repairs made, anything over $200 made, anything under 200. I mean, we didn't say what kind of repairs were made. If it's A to Z, top to bottom, left to right, or what? Um, we put it back on the market. We get a contract right away. Of course, it's a popular house. <clears throat> they have an inspection. They didn't ask for a copy of the first inspection and say, well, you knew this the whole time. We want our money back. So now what? You knew about this crawl space. It's in the first inspection. So I have a question on that. <laughs> I've got a lawsuit on my desk for it. We want to talk about it. So um, I want to be honest with you. So my question on that is if they don't give you the inspection report and we don't know exactly what it says, other than we know that the first buyer backed out of the deal, um, but they don't give us a copy of the inspection report. I mean, how much do we say well, if, if we don't, don't know the extent yeah. of what's being of why? Correct. You don't know why. Yeah, exactly. So that's why on buyer side, I say it's so important to check that box. Yes, I agree to share this one. And then two, you as a listing side, you know, know what you're accepting if they send you an inspection report. I almost prefer what I do personally is I do share the report and I kind of send that over to kind of get them prepped for, you know, look, we're asking for something off of this list. You see how what the list looks like. We're not going to ask for everything. I'm prepping you. Some of these things we're going to ask for is what mentally I'm doing. Um, I don't know that I wouldn't request partial or just give me the ones you want. Don't tell me everything as a, as a listing agent. Just to protect yourself. Um, now, they did agree to repair every single thing, even on the second inspection, except for at one item, putting a dehumidifier in the crawl. <clears throat> Buyer wants it. The seller has a contractor come out, and that contractor says, I know they requested it, but it's not needed. The inspection report says, Blah 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 blah. Crawl space, please have not you know, checked out by a license, uh, so on and so forth. So <clears throat> they don't agree to the dehumidifier because their contractor does not recommend one. So Jason, in that situation, was the home inspector? Well, I guess you could say they're a, they're an expert in inspecting crawl spaces, but we've seen inspection reports in just about everything that they find wrong says Have we recommend getting yeah yeah that licensed person or that qualified person to come out and take a better look at it right and so once they got that better look it wasn't needed according to that so i'm not an attorney i'm not going to act like one right? right kind of the same thing there is that so what what I would do is share that your that contractor that is an expert that we've hired that does that. And if I'm not going to put that in there, I say, look, I will agree to all these. And I won't agree to this because this contractor says X. And here's the paperwork from that contractor. Um, that covers everyone. Um, are there, you break your ankle and you want two opinions? Perfect. Absolutely true. If you want to get a second opinion, that's okay. Um, but it all goes back to the same disclose, disclose, disclose. I mean, you know, what if there's moisture in the crawl and the person, do you, do you have to change the RPD if you find out something? Supposed to. Yes, you're supposed to change the RPD. Even if they checked, I don't know, no rep, no rep, no rep. <clears throat> um, <laughs> Mark, I know, right? Stick a hundred, you know, you lost $5,000 over hundred dollar dehumidifier. So, um, but again, then the house went under sale, went right back on the market, went and sold within days again. It's, you know, how the market is. So, hey, so the other thing is we have brought in review of contracts back in house. So um, you all may not have known that, but we have. 
Um, and I, Chris Young, thank you so much. She's spearheading that. Um, so we do have an experienced agent that does have access to all of our systems and understands our systems and literally um, can contact us directly and no confusion about what's acceptable, what's not, what are we looking for, what's, you know, those kind of questionable items. I will say Natalie hit the nail on the head. Chris is running into all kinds of things checked on WWREA and agency and listing agreements because WWREA is where you explain all the types of agency that are possible. And you're supposed to check the one that would be applicable to the current transaction if you are, if you will. <clears throat> um, and then that's one shot at it. The second shot at it is on the agency agreement itself or the listing agreement itself is where they get to choose what they would like to do, how they choose to be represented. Is it okay to, you know, I only want to, one agent to represent me and that's it. It does not behoove them in our scenario to have a single agent rep because you just knocked out 284 other people that could bring you an offer. And I'm going to use this example. If I was a Hill Barber and you chose one agent rep, that not as, I'm not cutting out 285, I'm cutting out five. So that would be different if I chose no rep there um, or chose single rep there. Uh, the other thing is, you know, seller sub agency, if you haven't hired me yet, if you don't, I don't work for you yet. I'm technically showing this on behalf of the sellers because you haven't hired me in your agency agreement yet. Does that make sense? Some people don't get that one um, because we're showing houses without having agency first. <clears throat> um, which I'm not, I'm not saying you have to do that. You run your business how you want to. I'm just saying, let's check the right boxes and give the client the option of what to check when. We don't. Do you have a question? I do. Sorry, Mike's telling me not to ask it, but I'm going to. <laughs> oh, you can ask away. Yep. Um, and if I don't know- Seller sub-agency, Keller Williams doesn't do seller sub-agency. Correct? Right. Yeah, that's not something we practice. So, so our agents should never be checking that we do. Correct. That's, including in the MLSs. And why would you not want to do that? Because we don't practice it, number one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's Two the biggest thing. If you, find out, if you find out something on that appointment about that buyer client, you have to relay it back to the seller. Right. So therein lies the issue. Mm -hmm. So um, you would always say, you know, I'm a buyer's agent. A buyer's agent, that's what I do. I'm here to protect you from start to finish. And I don't charge you directly. And now I don't charge you directly, but now you pay for the house and the seller pays me. So that money is coming from you, but it's not coming with an invoice straight from me. So, um, and that's what the lawsuit is about right now, nationwide uh, about buyer agency is about, you know, we say it's free. Well, it's not free. Um, they just don't get paid directly from the buyer directly. So, hey, Chris, what were some others you brought up yesterday? Agency's a biggie. Um, I don't know if I got her or not. But as we come across things that are major, um, and I think it's a training issue on our side, you know, I'll own that. I will say, you know, we've missed the boat in some training opportunities. I'm not going to, I mean, let's, let's just own it. I'm not going to, you know, I'm sorry, but all I can do is what going forward, we can do the best we can with what I got. So we do have some training opportunities amongst some, um, some agents out there. Jason, Natalie, I just want to, did you hear me? Can you hear me? Okay. I did. Yeah. I saw you went off mute. So I thought you might have a question. Well, I just want to reiterate what I learned at GenUp so clearly, which is that if you do not have designated agent checked and you are in a transaction with another Keller Williams Central agent, you are now a referee. You cannot represent the buyer, even if there's an agent to represent the seller, unless it's designated 
if you are with Keller Williams Central, that has never in five years been explained to me exactly with that level of clarity. So I just wanted, for those of you that missed it like I did over the years, I just think it's like critical to understand that you have to be a referee unless designated as checked, even though there might be two agents involved. If they are with Keller Williams Central, that's the rule. Lord have mercy. Yeah, that's just keep makes you know the client so that we don't discuss back and forth and that agents are designated to each part of the transaction. So, and that's a huge confusion out there. And that's where they say, call the commission and say, I don't know who, you know, they were both Keller Williams. What do you mean who was who? So that's what they play, you know, they say when they write the report up to the commission is, you know, I think they were both, they all both knew the information or whatever it is. So um, another biggie, and I'm going to share screen on something. Y'all give me a chance to get there. Um, no, there it is. Share hey, screen. while you're looking at, at that or getting that other screen up, um, with regards to permitting, how many um, areas are there that must be permitted? And it's different from county to county, is that correct? It is. I mean, there's a standard within general, like general accepted counting practices like GAP. There's general ex, um, rules that everyone follows, but there could be layers or tiers on it that they add within, you know, each inspector might have their little nuances that they add or require because it's a person, it's a human. So they may go out and see things one thing way and you go out and see it a different. So it's kind of like an appraisal. There is some foundation stuff, but there's also some decision-making on a human that's factored in when they go out and see. Does that make sense? Yeah. Can you all see America's preferred warranty? Yeah. Okay. So this is the last page of their brochure. And the reason I bring it up is I don't want you to, I'm not saying I'm pushing America's preferred. Please don't say, think that. I'm telling you something they offer on the back page at the bottom right here, this little block under the red, the one I'm squaring off. This means that you offered it and they either took it or they waived it. So if you offer the every, I would every listing appointment, every buying appointment, I would tear this sheet out or use America's Preferred, and I'll tell you why I would do it is because if you get into a situation up for up to three years on that house that involves E and O, and you have this sign that they waive it, they will pay um, almost two thousand dollars towards your deductible just because you offered the waiver. So you're offering the warranty and say, this is what they offer. You know, it's not a requirement. It's something you may want to do and look over, but if you choose not to have them sign this, if you have that on file and you do have an E&O case, um, America's Preferred will actually donate money towards your deductible. And that's up to 5,000. Your deductible with KW, their E and O is five up to five K. So if you, it'd be great to get seventeen hundred bucks off of it, if by simply offering a warranty. Um, the other thing that you can get a deductible uh, waiver for are is three things. If you offer a home warranty, and they either take it or not, they don't have to take it. Um, they, there's an inspection on the property, number two. And anybody remember the third one? It was in GYA two months ago, I think, two weeks ago. Inspection, you offer the home warranty and professional services disclosure signed. 
three things. And that will get you up to $2,500 off of your deductible if you are in an E&O case that is from our E&O carrier. So you could technically get $2,500 from E&O if you were in a situation and $1,700 from America's Preferred. So if you're in an E&O and it's a $5,000 case and you're looking at $4,200, is that what that is? All by getting somebody offering a warranty, getting professional services, which is a requirement, and then um, an inspection on the property. So. And you have to have all three? Yeah, it's a three, it's all three or none. Okay. America's Preferred is just the one they will give you. That's something they do. Um, yeah. for, and, and they just want you to offer. And see, offering the warranty in the E&O, if you offer America's Preferred, that counts. So you're getting kind of double, double dip there. So PSD inspection, offer a warranty. Get them to sign it if they waive it. If you have all three and there's an E&O claim, that's a $2,500 discount. And if you use America's Preferred, it's an additional $1,700. Jason, I so, have something to add. I say that to protect you. Yes. Um, I actually tried to call Trevor yesterday to find out that Trevor is now a guy named Randy or Andy. Um, and so I didn't know if everybody else knew that, but there is a new Trevor. He's super nice. And uh, if you reach out to Trevor's old line, he does respond to that same number. Is Trevor the old America's preferred? Yeah, he's been with America's Preferred for years. He was at all of our bolds for years and everything else. So um, it was, it was, he left, I guess, about like, sometime, I think, in June or July. So, and I just haven't here's, needed to reach out. And then here's another one um, Elizabeth, Elizabeth Sokol, Sokol is America's Preferred Regional Sales Manager, Area Sales Manager. Out of Charlotte. So her number is 704 785 7560. And it's her email is E S O K O L at the initials for America's Preferred Home Warranty. So at APHW.com. So this is her. And I, please don't take that as a commercial for them personally. It, I mean, it sort of is because I'm trying to protect you as an agent. Um, but I would certainly like if I'm in a claim and it's $5,000, 4,200 of it coming from somebody else besides me. Um, if I'm, you know, Agent Smith. So um, <clears throat> the other one I wanted to see, you're, we, are going to be, I'm sorry, Jason, is there a digital copy of that brochure in like our Facebook group or anywhere? We are adding it um, as part of your packet for you to pull up when you pull up docs. So it will, will be in your DocuSign as a KW Central document so that you could technically just, it could be a part of your signature packet. You can also go to APHW.com and get it there. Okay, cool. Thanks, guys. Um, where did my chat go? Um, I want to see if I always struggle with getting um, this to work. So you're going to be guinea pigs. And I need to know if you can see and hear this. Um, did you all go to Facebook with me to watch a video? Yes or no? I still no. see us. Okay. All right. Let me try one more thing. Can you hear that? Nope. Okay. I think you're going to have to share the screen. Yeah, on the shared screen at the bottom, there's two boxes. 
and you need to check those boxes. One's, one's definitely for audio, and I can't remember what the other one's for. But you have to check them both. All right. Thank you. You might be teaching me something, and I certainly appreciate it. You're welcome. You're coming, you're coming from contribution, Mike. <laughs> Twice in one day, they'll start talking about it, you. It, it must be my day. <laughs> I don't know. So share sound and epitomize video clip. Is that yes. what I want to do? Correct. And then I need to go to what I want to share. Can you see that now? Um, yes. Delivered by my, Can you hear my law now? partners, John Waite. Now, John's been practicing law for 13 years, and he's been handling the hotline for the seven years that he's been with our law firm. So Can I you assure hear? you that he's very well qualified to speak with you today about the most common questions we've gotten on the hotline this year. So without further ado, and in the words of Ed. Can y'all hear that? That's what I need to know. Okay, good. All right, we'll go back to it. I just want to make sure. Ed McMahon, here's Johnny. Ah, thank you, Will. Appreciate it. Um, so today is actually going to be a preview of uh, the insight article, the next insight article is going to come out. I wrote an article talking about the top 10 actually um, legal hotline questions we got. And just so you all are aware, you know, these these questions fall into broad categories. And the way they're handled is you call the hotline and you'll talk to either me or Will, or we actually have two other guys right now that handle the hotline. Also, their names are Bill and Adam. Um, Adam came with us recently, but he was formerly a lawyer with the Real Estate Commission, so he's been a real good fit to help us with those sorts of issues and questions. Um, call the hotline, you talk to us, and you know we will help you out. Um, as far as categories, I'm, I'm going to go with a little bit more broad categories than I did for the Insight article, and where I want to start is actually Form 2T. If you're in the forms, you know, this by far, as far as questions, this is probably the most common form we get questions about. Those questions really go into uh, several different categories that I'll break down just a, a little bit. The first is usually formation, and what that has to do is whether the contract is effective or not, and if it is, what is the effective date. And this is defined uh, in the contract, I believe it's on page two of Form 2T, and it's pretty clear. And so when agents call in, it's usually something where we can do a pretty straightforward analysis of whether you're under contract or not and help give you some guidance. Um, the biggest guidance is this with respect to that. If you, um, if your client signs and that signing is communicated and you've had it from both sides, then you're under contract. But if you have, if your client signs and there's not been a communication about that signing, the other side has no clue that there's been a signing, then there is no effective contract at that point. There must be a signing and the signing has to be communicated from the last party. And that's how you know you're under contract. And you can imagine, you know, this, there's all sorts of little bunny trail questions that come off from that question of, um, you know, what happens if there's non-delivery of the money? You know, is there still a contract if the money has not been delivered? And the short answer, generally speaking, most cases is yes, there is a contract. And the reason is because of this. On the first page of the contract, it starts on the first page of the contract on Form 2T and kind of spills over onto the second page. And what that says is that if there's not a timely delivery of the money under the contract, then the seller needs to make a demand. And if the seller makes a demand, then the other side, the buyer gets one banking day. And with one banking day, they can make that payment. So that's really the, the crux of, of, you know, that issue with respect to the money is, is, you know, you're not in breach until that demand has been made. So that's why there's an effective contract, even if the money's delivered late. Another common kind of question we get on Form 2T is whether something is a fixture or not. Um, I serve on all the forms committees and help do edits. And if you have edits, uh, that you'd like to suggest for one of our forms, you can email the legal hotline 
And that email address is legalhotline at ncrealtors.org. Uh, but you can email us your suggestions and, and we take those to the committee and run them through staff and, and do our process. Uh, we are constantly updating the forms. It is a long year long cycle that wraps up in May with the new forms coming out July 1st. And then we start the process all over again in August. So there's really no time when it's not form season. We're either working on them or preparing to release them and then getting ready to field input for the next round. Anyway, fixtures in Form 2T is something that gets debated quite a bit in the forms committees because it's always changing, especially with technology. One change that's that's come up recently is what to do about these home gyms, you know, a relatively new phenomenon that really started catching on during COVID and just really sort of exploded and expanded. You know, what what are those? Are they fixtures or are they not? So the forms committee has been wrestling with that question, coming up with some edits, and I think the, they made some edits last year, and I think they'll make some further edits this year, um, but the cycle's not complete yet and won't be till May, so I don't know exactly what those will look like, but we get very common questions. The biggest thing that I have to talk to realtors about when they call and have a question in this category is you have to remember that there's two different kinds of fixtures in Form 2T. Number one is just regular old fixtures. The definition of fixtures under North Carolina law, and that's anything that's attached to the property. There's a uh, actually a factor test that goes into that. But basically, if it's attached, if it is part of the property, then it's going to be a fixture. The second thing is that bullet pointed list in paragraph 2V, 2B of Form 2T. And in that paragraph, there, there's all those bullets, all those things. If you look at those bullets, not all of those things are fixtures. Like the garage door opener, that's not a fixture, uh, generally speaking. The one that, one that, the fob that goes in your car, right? But it's listed in there because parties, generally speaking, are going to expect that to be part of the transaction. So that's why you know the committee put that in there to make sure that that's preserved. Um, I have to move my notes right here. There we go. All right. Finally, um, so, yeah, so that's, that's the question we usually get of fixtures. Finally, um, the, the last one, that, uh, you know, broad category and form 2D questions have to do with breach. And this is going to kind of go into my next topic, but I, I think it's important. And one of the ways we walk people through these sorts of issues on breach is, has the seller failed to do something that they're required to do in the contract or the buyer? Has either party done something or failed to do something that was in the contract? That's really the essence of a breach. And that's very different than the next uh, topic is actually disclosure. You know, agents asking, all right, well, do I have to disclose this or not? And most often a disclosure question is, you know, or it was really hinging on the agent calling the hotline and trying to figure out if they can get their due diligence feedback for their client. And that really gets into a question of, well, has there been a breach of the contract or has there been fraud? Some breaches are going to, if there is in fact a breach, are going to allow the buyer to get their due diligence feedback. That's in paragraph 23 of Form 2T. It talks about the remedies for breach. One of them is a return of the due diligence fee if there is in fact a breach. But the question of whether there's a breach is, an, is another issue. So let's say the seller hasn't breached. You know, if they fail to disclose something, then um, can we get the due diligence feedback that way? And the short answer is maybe. I mean, if there's been fraud, if there's been a deception on the part of the seller that the seller has done unlawfully, then the law provides remedies for a buyer in that situation. Um, and, the, and also the, the seller has protections too when it comes to breach. That's also paragraph 23. Paragraph 23 covers breaches by the buyer and by the seller and goes through the remedies of both. So first one, Form 2T, that, that's probably the most common uh, hotline question. Second hot, most common hotline question, disclosure. Third most common hotline question has to do with broad, you know, broadly speaking, the license law. Um, and I'll talk about just a couple different things uh, under the license law head heading that are pretty common questions. Number one, um, agents will call because they've received a letter of inquiry from the commission. Now, if you've never received one of these or dealt with one of these cases, let me just talk about it kind of generally. Somebody, whether it's a party of the transaction, maybe you represented them, maybe you didn't, um, or it could be another agent, 
uh, they'll file a complaint with the real estate commission explaining how they believe um, you may have violated the license law. And then there's a staff member at the commission that it could be an attorney, it could be a consumer protection specialist, it could be um, a couple different uh, categories of staff over the real estate commission to handle these sorts of things. They, they have a system by which they uh, hand that stuff out and they will perform an investigation. And that, and that first, you know, usually one of the first forms of that investigation is sending you, the agent, who's had the file, complaint filed against them, a letter of inquiry asking you to provide documentation and to respond to the allegations of the complaint, or sometimes a letter of inquiry. There'll be specific questions they will ask you in addition to whatever the complaint says. Um, and they'll, they, they just want all sorts of information about the transaction. They will use the information from that inquiry to determine whether there's probable cause to believe that the agent has violated the license law. If there's probable cause, then they'll go through a settlement conference. So you'll get an opportunity to settle it by agreement. That's probably, you know, 99% of the time when you see names in the back of the bulletin, they've negotiated uh, that settlement and resolution and agreed to abide by the terms by it. There wasn't a full hearing from the commission. But if you don't want to settle it by consent, you don't have to. You could have the right to be heard in front of the full commission. And so, you know, that doesn't happen very often, but every once in a while it does. Every once in a while you may feel that you're not getting a fair offer uh, under the facts and you think that the commission would have, um, you know, more sympathy on you or, or agree with you more than what the commission staff is up to that point. Um, I will tell you, my law firm uh, handles, you know, dozens of real estate commission cases a year. Um, and, you know, we are, our experience with the commission staff is that, you know, they are not out to get you. They are out to try and be fair. They are out to be diplomatic. And they're out to enforce the license law, sure. But they're not trying to ruin anyone's life. They're really not. They're just trying to do their jobs the best that they can. Uh, I would say, in the litigation context, you know, they are probably one of my favorite institutions to deal with as far as opposing counsel goes. Uh, they're just good, good folks over there, pretty reasonable. But, you know, also advocating hard for the state, which is their job and, and consumer protection. So anyway, so that's probably one of the most common questions uh, that comes up in the realm of license law. And it's sort of an ancillary question to that that I sort of broke out was, have I done something wrong? Um, and so, you know, there's not a complaint yet, but agents will call us on the hotline and be like, did I do something wrong here? Did I actually mess up or not? And sometimes the answer is probably yes. And sometimes the answer is no, I don't think so. Um, it really varies case to case and, and really varies on, uh, what the severity might be. Sometimes people will call and you know, it's been a very, even if it is, you know, even if they technically violated one prior license law, they'll, they'll call it and, and, you know, worried that they're going to lose their license and things like that. And just based on the very minor nature of whatever it is, uh, I can usually tell them with a reasonable degree of certainty, you know, the chances of the commission taking you, taking your license, even for a brief period of time are relatively zero. You know, there's a lot of other options for discipline that the commission is going to look at especially if it's your first time, you know, they're, they're not looking to yank your license. They understand that you need that in order to live. And I think that they are, are very considerate about that. Um, other times agents will call and, you know, give a rundown. And my advice is you better call your, you know, character, a carrier now, because um, if you get nothing else out of today, you should know and remember a lot of ENOs will assign you counsel for free to deal with a real estate commission complaint. So it's a it's just a benefit of your policy. It's already there, you might as well use it. Um, sometimes you can request what law firm you want to help and sometimes you can't. So it just depends on the flexibility of whatever you know character that you have or carrier that you have, but you know they may or may not offer that as an option. All right, so and recap again, number one was form 2T, number two, disclosure, number three, license law, number four, is commissions and talking about money and about getting paid and, and things in that realm. Um, one of the one of the questions that we get one, or one of the things that will help people through on the hotline is really procuring cause. Are you the procuring cause of the transaction? Um, and this is a, a, 
probably the most common advice I give in this realm is that procuring cause is not some simple analysis. It's really not. There's a simple definition for it that the National Association puts out. But in truth, if you end up in an arbitration proceeding, the, the analysis, the factor sheet to go through all those things is three pages long. So, and there's a, just a whole host of things that they're looking at. Agency agreement, whether you have one or not, is just one of those factors. Uh, there's, there's just many, many, many things that an arbitration panel will look at. So at the end of the day, they're going to weigh all those factors. But, and, and I think it's important that, that realtors remember this, arbitration panels are strongly encouraged, uh, not by us at NC Realtors, but by the National Association and, and rules to award the entire commission to one party or the other. There's not supposed to be very much of baby splitting going on in front of these arbitration panels. So before you really start decide to dig your heels in and, and, and make a, a, you know, start an arbitration proceeding or, or get into one, um, you know, may, say you get roped into one by somebody else, if you can't, there's a lot of benefit to working out by consent if you can work it out by consent, because if you roll the dice in front of an arbitration panel, then you, there's a, a real good chance you'll end up with zero if you don't win everything, which is not really, you know, that, you know depending on the case, that may not be a good option for you or not. Uh, the second uh, question that I sort of broke out in this category is, um, can I share my commissions with a party? And the answer to that generally is yes. A lot of times agents will call, there's something has happened. They just want to make sure that they can share their commission uh, in a way in a transaction that doesn't, you know, run them afoul of the license law. And the biggest thing is this, is that as long as you're not sharing your commission with unlicensed people to give you referrals, you know, if it's a party of the transaction, the answer to that question is nearly always yes. You're, you're, you are allowed to share your commission with any party of the transaction or the other agent. Um, there's not very much limitation on that as long as you're not committing loan fraud. So just, you know, make sure everybody knows what's going on, you know, the lender and, and the closing attorney and people of that nature. But as far as whether you can or not, you know, that, that that's not really a thing. But, you know, it's a very common question. And I think people just like the ability to call and to get that confirmation and then move on. And, you know, we're happy to provide that service. Then the fifth category is ethics and this is the code of ethics specifically um under this broad heading i think that i think i don't know i i'll just put it this way my experience has been the most common questions on article 16. article 16 has to do with whether an agent you know uh in violation of the code took my client or not a lot of times there'll be agents calling and the, it's really revolving around this question of whether they took a client improperly or whether they, or whether someone else did that to them. Um, and one of the things I always have to talk about um, in this arena or pretty frequently is, you know, just because you have an agency agreement doesn't mean your client can't get services. If they have told you unequivocally that, hey, you're not my agent anymore, um, they're allowed to do that under our standard forms. It does not, it does not relieve them of their potential uh, to be liable for two commissions because they have signed an agency agreement with you. And my experience litigating our forms in court, whether they're agency agreements or whether they're contracts for you know purchase of the property, uh, they work very effectively and courts enforce them. There's actually a pretty significant case out of the North Carolina Supreme Court last year on Form 2T really upholding a lot of the uh, provisions in there that, that we already felt were very enforceable. So as far as our confidence in, in the forms, having the power and ability to work the way that they're supposed to work in most circumstances, you know, I have pretty strong confidence in that. So, you know, your client, you know, very well, uh, if they leave you and, and have told you, you know, um, you're not my agent anymore, even though you have an exclusive agency agreement, they can do that. Um, and that's something that agents usually wrestle with because obviously the code is pretty clear. You're not supposed to go around pilfering other people's clients and things of that nature. And that's true. You know, you, you definitely cannot do that under the code. Um, but, you know, in a circumstance where there's clearly been a cutoff of agency, you know, the client wants to risk potentially having to pay two commissions, you know, then 
agents can work that out. A lot of times agents will simply work it out by entering into a referral fee agreement and just letting the client go so that they don't create too many problems, but also get some compensation for the time they've already spent. All right, so to recap, the top five that I've gone over today is Form 2T, Disclosure, License Law, Commissions, and the Code of Ethics. All right, and I'm gonna uh, head over to the chat and it doesn't look like there's any question. Thank you. Thank you, sweetie. So, did that help? Clear as mud? <laughs> um, yes, Tara, we can send it out. Um, it'll be in the Facebook group later. That's one of the, um, another one of the Monday, mobile Mondays are good. So I will try to put those out every time I catch one that's going to be beneficial to us. So anything else you want to ask while you got me? I'm wide open. That's the one thing I wanted to ask, and I'm, I think I'm pretty sure I know the answer, but the um, inspection reports, going back to that, once they're shared with us, we can share those with anyone right yeah you can okay once it's shared then yes um okay. and they have to check permission that they're they share it and and if they share it it could be all or just portions of right and it's kind of what goes back to what you said earlier just send me the section of what you're asking us to fix <laughs> i'd know? much rather have that on the listing side because i you know if you give me the whole thing i know it all and i have to disclose it all potentially um, Correct. And if you just send me the five you want, then I don't know as much. Um, and I know that, you know, I, I answer the big hotline on occasion, and I know that question has come up a couple of times over probably the whole time I've been uh, helping out with that. Um, and so I just want to make sure I, I've, I've always been under the impression that once it's shared, yes, you can share it. That, that's what, what I was taught. Gosh, way back. Yeah, yeah. yeah we I just feel... covered that in Gen Up as well, Mike. And okay. he uh, in Gen Up told us absolutely once it's shared, it's public knowledge, it's public information. And as a listing agent, if I want to share it to the next party, I'm allowed. Yeah. Okay. All good ones. Lesson, it's good to see you. Good to see you too. <laughs> yeah, welcome. It's um, if you all don't know Lesson, Lesson came on, gosh, right, almost right after me a little bit, and um, so okay, we're excited. One to have, week later. Yeah, we're very excited to have her a part of the team. So, um, all right, I'll let you guys have your day back. I could not appreciate you more. And if there's something you want from this or um, every every time we meet, and my goal is to give the agents useful information that they can um, use in their businesses and also protect you and us. Um, but that's what I'm here for. So I appreciate y'all giving me some time today, and I will let you go. Jason, thank you for your time. I would like to see thank the you. first part. It, it's recorded, Laysan, and he'll put it back out. So he'll send a link of it. It'll be on the um, YouTube page. Remember that I am new. Yeah, it's going. It's yeah. recorded, but I need to know where can I find it. Yeah, we'll get it to you for sure. I'll make sure that okay, Daniel perfect. gets it to you. Thank yeah, you. they he puts them out every week. So, but I'll make sure that um you know how to get there. Thank you. Thank Dan. you, Jason. Right. Nice Appreciate to meet you, you Jason. <laughs> Thank you. Nice to meet you too.